Worst case scenario, the Soviets got their missiles off first and we didn't have a chance to react quickly. You know, in a worst case scenario, there's, they could make a complete strike before we had a chance to fully respond. But, you know, the, the other argument is, well, everybody was watching everybody anyway, so the chances of there ever being a winner would have probably been pretty low. But the, the scenario that the military had was, well, let's say, in a worst case, you know, significant parts of the US just get obliterated. How do we respond? Well, if you've got a base on the moon where you could target the Soviet Union with missiles, a huge arsenal, and just fire them down at the Soviets that way, it would make the job a lot easier. Um, and that's what Project Horizon was about. The idea was to build like a, what would start off as kind of like a North Pole or South Pole outpost on the moon, which eventually would be added to and added to, and eventually would be this sort of huge, sprawling installation. And the plan was to put it on the far side of the moon, which would protect it even more. Um, now, bear in mind that NASA um, didn't put a man on the moon till uh, 1969, and it was only, it was only at, at the turn of the 1960s, you know, that people even started going into space. Um, the plan that the Army had was to have the first rudimentary steps of this base in place on the moon by 1965, um, which, you know, four years even before NASA landed anybody on the surface of the moon anyway. Now, the official story is that Project Horizon was cancelled because of, for two reasons, one, budgets, and the other one, the concern about whether or not the technology was sufficiently advanced, not just to get people up there, but to sort of lower all this you know, machinery onto the surface and sort of build some sort of base, which to an extent I'm sure is quite true. You know, the, the technology may not have been that advanced at the time. But what's interesting is that in the same year, 1965, that the space was supposedly the first steps of it were going to be secretly constructed. Um, a former US Air Force man, who again has gone on record now, a man named Carl Wolf, um, he said he was working at Langley on a NASA related program and was told about photographs that NASA had taken um, on the moon, on the far side of the moon, of what looked like some sort of installation that had been built there. You know, everybody says that's alien. You know, it's got to be aliens if there's a base on the moon back in the 60s. And if there was, you know, it stands a good chance that it could well have been alien. But on the other hand, 1965 was the exact year that Project Horizon was supposedly going to get its first tentative steps onto the moon. Um, you know, is that coincidence? Was Horizon really cancelled and it just so happens that a real base built by aliens happened to be seen in the same year that the Horizon people were going to sort of venture onto the moon, you know, was Neil Armstrong really the first person on the moon? You know, these are all the questions scenario provokes, if you like. And um, another aspect of this, again, a very controversial one, is that I'm sure many of you may know, about 10 years or so ago, an Englishman named Gary McKinnon um, hacked into NASA and various other military and government installations in the US and you know there's some people in the UFO community who think this is sort of cool and exciting but you know I tell people you know he's facing now like 70 years in prison in the you know being extradited to the US and put in a US prison for the rest of his life um, people say you know oh you know this they kind of view it as being some sort of crusader my view is that you know, he wasn't a terrorist or anything like that, but he did something very, very stupid. You know, nobody should be hacking into the systems of NASA, the military or whatever. You know, if you want to do UFO investigations, that's fine. But if you're going to do that, you know, don't complain if the government come knocking on your front door, take you away, if you're going to hack into official government systems. And that's what McKinnon did. Um, so, you know, I'm, I, I don't endorse anybody doing that. I'm, you know, telling people, I, do not do that. Um, uh, not unless you have some sort of weird reason for wanting to end up in prison for the next 40 years, which I'm sure none of us do. Um, but what McKinnon said he saw when he hacked into the systems, he said he saw a listing of military personnel that were described, as, in his own words, he, he described them, the title of these, um, like a fleet of personnel, was non-terrestrial officers. And it was all like Colonel, whoever, Major, whatever, you know, Major Smith, Colonel Jones, etc. Um, and this sort of very weird term, non terrestrial officers, the officers' term kind of sounded like military. Non terrestrial sounds like off the planet. 
and this was like a classified listing held by NASA that originated with somebody else. So in other words, it was like off-limits, um, off-planet astronauts, and it was a list of names, etc. Now McKinnon, you know, we have to take his word at it because he said he didn't print anything off and download it. He just sort of read it online. Um, the government denies, you know, that, that they were hiding anything along those lines. Um, so again, it's sort of like an up-in-the-air situation as to as to where we know what's going on versus what isn't going on. But you know, the very fact that we hear stories like this and Carl Walt's story in the Project Horizon documents has sort of led to a lot of theories that you know, moon bases, a secret moon prog program, um, installations on the moon, and that that might explain the sort of seemingly total, uh, I guess, sort of disregard for you know, the way the nation tries to advance itself in many other ways, you know, science, technology, medicine, etc. But for some reason, it's out of space. It's almost like America's just said, no, you know, I'll just call it a day. Um, if you actually have a secret program that's doing the sort of things that you would expect NASA to do, that might explain this sudden about face which sort of flies in the, which flies in the face of sort of, you know, the American dream, you know, to sort of better yourself and take things further and, and advance further. You know, just say, nah, just forget it. You know, we've, we're done with outer space. So, you know, we can look at it from different directions, different perspectives. And unfortunately, the, the data sort of goes in different directions as well. You know, it's, I sometimes think it could just be coincidence that there was a secret plan to put a base on the moon by 65. But the fact that somebody happened to see this base, you know, did we really have the technology back then to secretly fly craft into space, you know, with all these different parts that would create the buildings and the tunnels to interlock them, etc., and not find out about it, you know, for the secret to remain hidden. I think, you know, that in itself is an issue that, I won't say it's impossible, but it's, it's sort of stretching things to a, a pretty significant degree, I think. Now that's, uh, don't worry, that's not a real <laughs> underground monster or anything like that. It's actually a photograph taken in a series of caves in England where they have sort of these weird creatures on display, you know, sort of the tourists you can go around and see um, all these different sort of strange creatures on display. But I put that up there for a reason, just to sort of illustrate the next story. Um, one of the people who I interviewed, um, actually not too long ago, and whose story I included in the book, um, was a man <coughs> excuse me, named Walter Bosley. And Walter was a former um, officer, uh, or operative, sorry, I should say, with the Air Force's Office of Special Investigations. Um, and Walter has spoken out on the record about his father's knowledge of the Roswell story. And it's a very, it's an interesting story, but it's a very weird story as well, because it sort of flies in the face of all the accepted stories about Roswell, even those coming from the government about, oh, it was just a weather balloon or whatever. And Walter's story, uh, from, or his father's story, I should say, is that in the 1960s, his father, who worked on um, space medicine programs, in other words, the way in which, you know, when human beings go into space, we want to know how people are going to react to low atmosphere, low gravity or no gravity, you know, how is it going to affect your blood pressure, your balance, that sort of thing. And Walter said that his father got this briefing about Roswell and was told that, yes, the Roswell incident did occur, nothing to do with weather balloons or secret government programs, and he, was, he said he was told that, it's, that after the investigation, spending years studying the Roswell bodies and the craft, that the government had come to the conclusion that again he had nothing to do with aliens, even though he had nothing to do with secret military programs. Um, Walter's father said that the government has supposedly learned that deep in the American Southwest, um, predominantly New Mexico, there was sort of this vast network of underground caverns and there was this ancient terrestrial race sort of semi-related to the human race. In the same way, you know, today, we're homo sapiens. Um, you know, before us there was Neanderthal man, Cro-Magnon man, and things like that. And the story was that this was another offshoot, but an unknown offshoot, um, living deep under New Mexico, the sort of the last remnants of this ancient human race. Um, and that it was, it was these people who were responsible for the Roswell crash. He was told that, you know, they don't like the fact that the human race, as we are, has sort of taken over the planet and infested it, and they were supposedly the original rulers of the planet, um, and, you know, they want to take back what's theirs. 
and you know they're sort of stealthily working underground for the day when they sort of return. Again, you know, was Walter's father told a truth, or was he told a lie to hide something else about Roswell? You know, we don't know, but it's, the story relates to sort of these weird creatures living underground. And Walter's father was told, you know, that they look close enough to us that if you were to walk past them in the street and you didn't take too much of a close look, you wouldn't see many differences. If you got a bit close, you might think it was a person who'd got a, maybe a couple of genetic anomalies or something like that. Uh, and what's interesting is if we look into the history of the UFO subject, we do find a lot of stories about like the men in black. You know, they, they kind of look like us, but they look weird. You know, they're kind of shorter, they're skinnier, they're really sort of super pale. Their eyes are kind of slightly offset. And that's, you know, why people say, well, they wear these sort of pulled down fedora hats, wrap around sunglasses, collars turned up on the coats to not just intimidate people because it actually camouflages the fact that they, they look like us but there are a few subtle differences. If any of you have written, excuse me, read um, Whitley Strieber's Transformation book, I think it's Transformation, he talks in there about how just after his first UFO book, Communion, was published, um, one of the people, the publishers who was working on the book, told a story about how he went into a bookshop and saw this strange looking couple reading the book. And he said they were small and weird and these sort of piercing, almost like, you know, the sort of eyes that a dog has when it's about to bite you. And they were small and had collars turned up and glasses on and, and they looked weird. You know, they looked human, but they looked not human as well. And that's coming from somebody at the publisher. So, um, you know, it, 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 again, it sounds bizarre, but we can find some sort of aspects that tend to verify the scenario. You know, are they literal ancient humans? You know, are they aliens? Is it something else? You know, it's, I can tell you as far as I can take the story. You know, and that's that's as far as we are with with Walter's father's story right now. That's uh, the El Yunque rainforest in Puerto Rico. I've been on a number of expeditions to Puerto Rico looking for this strange creature known as the chupacabra, and the chupacabra is sort of this well, this strange animal that's described as sort of about four to five feet tall, kind of monkey-like, chimpanzee-like, but with no hair or fur, um, vicious claws and fangs. Um, these large eyes, sort of wraparound eyes almost, that supposedly at night kind of self-illuminated or glow. And it has this sort of vicious row of spikes down its head and neck, but sort of like a punk rock mohawk type haircut in simplistic terms, I suppose. So it looks like a weird, weird looking creature. Um, now, Puerto Rico, when the sightings of the Chupacabra really kicked off in the mid-1990s, this coincided with a wave of UFO activity all across Puerto Rico as well. And on every occasion I've been to Puerto Rico doing these Chupacabra investigations, people have told me, and this includes like police officers, civil defense people on the island, um, that supposedly in the El Yunque rainforest, again, like with Dulce and some of these other places, there's supposedly some installation controlled by literal extraterrestrials and that the government knows about it but isn't able to do anything about it, can't control the situation. A lot of people have also made sort of parallel stories with the fact that um, many reports of UFOs have been made late at night. Many of them made by police officers who are sort of often on duty, you know, in the late at night in the early hours of the morning, where they said they've seen large UFOs coming out of the waters, the oceans that surround Puerto Rico, you know, being an island environment. And this has sort of given rise to rumors about not like an underground base, but an undersea base somewhere off the coast of Puerto Rico. Um, you know, literally sort of deep below the seabed, kind of, the, you know, you imagine the sort of thing you see in like a James Bond movie, that, that type of sort of secret underground installation. Um, so that's just, that's actually just two uh, places on Puerto Rico. There's also a third one that sort of ties in with secret installations. Um, the US Navy had a, quite a significant presence on Puerto Rico for a, a long time at a base called Roosevelt Roads, um, which is now closed down. It, it's just like an airport now. It's not, uh, it doesn't fall under the jurisdiction of the US Navy. But it was sort of like a central hub of the Navy's presence in that area for a long time. And again, from at least, at least three or four civil defense people, a couple of police officers, and also a couple of veterinarians who analyzed animals supposedly attacked and killed by the chupacabra. They to all told a story, but from their own sort of perspectives, of supposedly three or four very vicious chupacabra supposedly having been captured in the early 1990s by what you would call kind of like um, 
like a, dif a definitive delta force type organization and held in a secure location at Roosevelt Roads before being transferred out to the United States for, you know, who knows whatever purposes. Um, again, you know, it kind of sounds like something straight out of the, like the Predator movies, you know, this sort of hostile creature being hunted down or hunting down the military. Um, but again, the, the, you know, the fact that whether the story is true or not, it's well known on the island and, and a number of significant people with verifiable you know, very good credentials, military, police, etc., have spoken out about their knowledge of it, and that's one of the reasons you know I like to go back to Puerto Rico because it's, it's you know it's an enclosed environment, an island location, so you have a, a fairly I won't say a fairly good chance, but at least you have a better chance of investigating something that's sort of static in one area than you know something that's sort of randomly flying across the sky. So there's no doubt in my mind that there's something weird going on on Puerto Rico, and I do believe you know, this creature exists, or that these creatures exist. Again, what they are, you know, that's the big question. The theories amongst the people on Puerto Rico, they sort of wildly vary. You know, you have the UFO alien theory. There are other people who think it's some sort of giant bat-like animal, because there are a number of reports where the creature's supposedly being seen with these huge wings, but membrane-type wings, the sort that a bat would have rather than a bird. Um, other people think it's some sort of supernatural thing that's been you know, literally sort of conjured up in some ritual. And then there's also the theory that, it, you know, could it be some sort of um, genetically mutated animal? You know, like somebody's been fringe science. You know, probably 30 years ago people have written this off, but when we see things like gene splicing today and, you know, all sorts of weird legislation put in place to not crossbreed different types of animals, you know, which has actually been researched and to an extent, you know, undertaken, this has like, given rise to the idea, you know, could it be some sort of real life Dr. Frankenstein type situation and the creatures have escaped, etc., and they're running loose. You know, whichever theory is correct, you know, they're all pretty entertaining and intriguing. Um, and they're still going on to this day, so, you know, it's, it's very much a continuing mystery. And that's just a, a picture of the oceans. You can see how far it goes off the coast. Now, that's the um, Philadelphia Naval Yard in, uh, in Philadelphia, um, where allegedly back in 1943, there's a famous story of what's become known as the Philadelphia Experiment. And supposedly, according to legend, the Philadelphia Experiment um, was an example by the military of trying to achieve radar invisibility, in other words, what today's stealth technology and aircraft offers, trying to develop radar, excuse me, radar invisibility and also um, invisibility to magnetic mines. At the time, the, the Germans had these magnetic mines, which, you know, it would be cat catastrophic if, you know, battleships going along in the ocean. Um, and basically, you know, these mines would just sort of blow the ships up. So the idea was to try and develop uh, radar invisibility and magnetic invisibility. The, the legend suggests that the military or the navy was doing sort of these very weird fringe science experiments and inadvertently, not deliberately as many people assume, but inadvertently rendered the ship literally optically invisible, you know, kind of invisible man invisible. Um, and the story is that it had a lot of drastic and terrible side effects on the crew members, people went mad. Uh, others died, etc. Some were supposedly just vanished in the blink of an eye, never seen again. Uh, you know, whether it's true or not, you know, even the Navy doesn't dismiss something happened. They say, well, yeah, we were doing experiments, and the, the, but they, that, what they talk about is the radar invisibility and the magnetic invisibility, and they said a lot of these stories stem from that word invisibility, and people sort of put two and two together and made ten and assumed, you know, we're talking about literal invisibility. Um, but then the Navy changed its story and added another aspect to it and said that some of the experiments they were doing resulted in like what called like corona discharges where you see you know like lights etc and sort of weird phenomena and they said well that accounts for some of these stories about people hallucinating and seeing strange things. But it was actually it wasn't an addition to the story, it was like a change to the story which that's kind of like what the Air Force has done with Roswell. You know, it's changed its story like four times now on what happened at Roswell. Uh, first it was a weather balloon, then it was a mogul balloon to test for, uh, excuse me, first it was a flying saucer 
that was the official response. Then it was a weather balloon. Then it was a mogul balloon to to um, to search for atomic explosions by the Russians. Then they said that at first they said there were no bodies. Uh, and then they said, well, there were bodies, but there were crash test dummies used in high altitude parachute experiments. But, so that's just an aside. But what's intriguing, in the same way the Air Force has changed its story on Roswell, so the Navy has changed its story several times on the Philadelphia experiments. Now, people have claimed that these experiments at Philadelphia um, were basically hastily shut down by the government who said, you know, we're not, not sure what we're dabbling in, so we're just going to shut it down. But the story was that in the 50s, the program was reopened again at a place called the Montauk Air Force Station on Long Island, which originally called Camp Hero, then it became Montauk. And now it's closed down. It's actually a state park. But back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, there were a lot of rumors that supposedly the Philadelphia experiment research was undertaken at, um, at Montauk. Um, and, you know, when we talk about things like invisibility and then the outgrowth of that was things like um, teleportation, you know, the sort of thing that you see in Star Trek that worked very well and that didn't work so well in the fly. And, and um, you know, you have this sort, of, this sort of technology that sounds, you know, absolutely fringe technology. People say, you know, there's no way this could be going on. You know, there's no way the government could be researching invisibility and teleportation. It's just not feasible. Uh, but I use the Freedom of Information Act to actually get hold of a, a US Air Force document, actually from only about 10 years ago. It's called the Teleportation Project. And the US Air Force actually contracted out to a private body in Nevada to, to, to determine the feasibility of whether or not teleportation could be achieved. Now, the official result was that, well, it's not impossible that it could be achieved, but today's technology just doesn't allow for it. But the very fact that we now know that the government secretly did or quietly did research the area leaves the door open, you know, to the possibility that some of this could have been tied in, or additional research, I should say, could have been tied in with things going on at Montauk. Now, as I said, you can go to Montauk today to State Park. But there are a lot of people who claim that the old lower levels of the base are still in operation. You know, it's, I, I don't know. Um, so that's, that's sort of the story of Montauk, which, you know, if you, if you Google Montauk plus Philadelphia experiment, I think, you know, it's one of, the, one of the areas where there's so many books published on it, you know, you can just find masses of material. Um, so I hope that's sort of given you sort of an insight into some of these locations. But, um, you know, as I said, throughout what we know about these installations in terms of what we can prove is going on what we think's going on what might be going on what some people tell us ago is going on but their stories are based on you know situations and information related to them you know by somebody else it's really difficult to you know to sort of really nail it and say this is what we can say about this base and that's you know one of the primary reasons is because many of these locations if not all of them are off limits to the general public. So to a degree at least, inevitably, you know, stories and rumors and legends are going to develop. That, that, that always happens, you know, where there's a, oh, there's a secret place, you know, and it's kind of like with lake monsters and things like this and Bigfoot, you know, I do a lot of investigations into these areas, but wherever you get kind of a mysterious lake, legends develop about the creature in the lake or somebody went missing swimming in there once. You know, it doesn't mean all these stories are folklore, but it means sometimes the human mind, you know, we, we're fascinated by mysteries. So, as I said, I hope that's given you a sort of an insight into s just a handful, you know, of these off-limits installations around the world. And uh, if anybody's got any questions, I'll <laughs> be okay. pleased to Those answer them. New Mexico. Uh -huh. They yeah. mentioned Paul Benowitz. Uh, yeah. passed away. But what about Thomas Costello, who ever did and ever did exist, and Phil Snyder, which is a wealth of information on his speeches on the internet mm -hmm. right there. Uh, where he was eventually in a fight with Reagan and he had his yeah. fingers. Yeah, on. yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people who've spoken out about their alleged involvement in the Dulce story or knowledge of it. Um, some of them are military people, some intelligence people. Um, the one of the most recent ones, um, actually, a guy who he came forward but didn't come forward under his own name or his public name or whatever. So, you know, again, it's. Um, it's sort of, to a degree, it's hearsay. But this came to a, re a Dulce researcher named Anthony Sanchez, and this military guy told him there are actually three installations, not just one. Um, you know, I don't dispute the possibility that the, the base exists. 
one of the main reasons being there's all this verifiable weird activity in Dulce. You know, as I said, that that's not hearsay about that atomic little detonation. Right. You know. Did you ever go up there physically? The I've been to. I haven't been up the, the mace, but I've been to the mace. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, but there's nothing. You know, on the outside at least, there's nothing strange about the mace. It's just a, a the huge mace. Won't even go up there. No, they won't. They have a lot of superstitions about it. Um, and, you know, so we, we know strange stuff's gone on in the area. That's what leaves me, or leads me to.